Now we're going to look at a nice feature selection method example. Okay, and this is a very famous example. I picked this one because uh, it's a whole area of research. There are like people, researchers, who just specialize in sparse uh, feature selection methods and sparse models, uh, sparse machine learner models. You can do a lot of things of, um, you know, like with sparse models, but today I just want to introduce briefly uh, the intuition uh, of sparsity and how can we use, what is this concept basically, okay? So here, uh, this is called the, um, the lasso model. So we're going to look at this paper. It's, uh, it was, oh, actually, this is wrong. It's not, I don't think, it's, I think I put the wrong date probably. It's just to double check. Okay. So it's, it should be quite an old paper, uh, the original paper on lasso. So it's um, least, it's called least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. So, uh the, the code should be available online for you guys to test if you want to try it. But let me just explain that intuition. What is the idea here? So, for example, looking at this, we have our matrix X, okay? This is our training matrix. Uh, we have N samples, D features, and then what we have, we have a target output vector, okay? So it should be, well, I should, we have a target output vector. One, two, three, four, five, okay. So this is the target output vector Y train. And our goal is to learn a mapping function that maps these features, each, you know, sample basically, onto its score or its target label, okay, if we want to classify or predict. How to create this mapping? In a very simple, intuitive way, looking at dimensionalities, this is an n times d matrix, this is an n times 1 matrix. So to basically go from n times d to n times 1, what do we need to do? We can just create a d times 1 vector. This will disappear, okay? And then we're going to have, sorry, the d dimension will annihilate, disappear, and we're going to have an n times 1. So basically here what we need to learn, we need to find a vector called alpha, Okay, when we multiply the X train by the alpha of dimensionality D, okay, so this is a D-dimensional vector, we will get something closer to the target scores, okay? So now alpha can be uh, a weight vector, so what does it do? So alpha, when we multiply it, if you guys remember, so we can kind of rotate the whole thing, okay, and take the first value, multiply it by you know, the first uh, feature, right? The second weight of alpha, multiply it, add and multiply it. So it's just, you know, summation with multiplication. That's just basic linear algebra. And imagine here, if, for example, I'm just saying, for the first feature in alpha, for alpha 1, I give a very high value, like 0 0.9. And for feature, you know, 2 in alpha, or element 2, okay, right there, I give a very low value, okay? What does it mean? It means when I'm multiplying my alpha with all those features, I'm somehow learning how to weigh them. I'm giving high weights, high importance to, you know, relevant features, feature one, and low importance to irrelevant features, feature two. Because at the end, what is this element yi right here? It's just a linear combination of your alpha i with your, um, you know, if you're you have all your features, okay? This is your first y, i, your element right there, okay? So here, what we are doing, this is a feature, a single feature, okay? And we are weighing the feature. This is a weight for the ith feature, okay? So imagine this is what we call like generally a weighted uh, summation, okay? So linear combination. We want to get the target y for the sample. This is generally uh, quite simple, it's just weighing features, but if we add a constraint, and this constraint would be that 
alpha has many zeros, okay? And a few basically non-zero elements or weights. We call them also weights. Okay, so this means that your alpha is sparse. Okay, so sparsity means that many values in your alpha would be equal to zero, and only a few will be equal to one or something close to one. So if you plot your alpha, so this is a diagram, so this, these are all the values, all the elements in your alpha, okay? So you have D, D values, okay, alpha D. What you're going to notice that um, around one, right there maybe, you have peaks. So these are important features. And the rest, the remaining features, are not important. They're close to zero. Okay, that's your alpha. And this is why we call it a sparse selection because you're selecting a very few non-zero elements or <coughs> features to train your model. Now, if you look at this, when you multiply, what does it mean? If we do the operation for the first vector, first sample, second sample, third sample, etc., these zeros will be, you know, multiplied by all these features, right? So the first four features will take zeros, so they don't count. The last two, they will not count. It's only these two features that will count. For example, if I have in the first sample, let's say, I'm just going to do this example right here. So if I have one, two, three, one, two, four, one, three. Okay, these are my features. And I multiply them by the alpha. What I will get for the second sample, for the as a prediction for this score. Basically, all of those will not count because they will be multiplied by zeros. It's only these two that will be selected. So I'm going to have a score of six. Okay, great. So that's what we call sparse feature selection. Now, you know that we can formalize this as a loss function. Can you guys try to write it down? So this is just the intuition, but we want to formalize this as an optimization problem. What is what are we minimizing? So what what are we estimating? What is the parameter that we want to estimate? Guys, how can how are we performing the feature selection? We want to learn how to find the best alpha in such a way that by doing this math right here, this multiplication, I get a score very close to my ground truth, right? Okay, a prediction close to my ground truth. So if we're minimizing a loss function, we're minimizing over what? What do we want to estimate? The space of alphas, right? So we want to find the optimal alpha. So in such a way that if I multiply my x times alpha, I get something close to what? The ground truth. So in that case, x alpha minus the ground truth, this is the distance we want to minimize, right? We want to minimize the mapped vector or the prediction with respect to the ground truth, right? So this is x train, train, and this is what we want to optimize. So now, to make this sparse, we add what we call, first it was defined as the L0 norm. So L0 is just, you know, the number of, non-zero elements. You just count the number of non-zero elements in a, in a vector, but to solve it in a better way, we define the L1 norm, and L1 norm is just the, uh, of a vector alpha, it's just the summation over all of its elements taking their absolute values, okay? So this is, you know, basically minimizing this under a particular constraint, okay? So to solve this problem, um, it's pretty challenging. So, so far, what we have seen is only what we call convex methods generally, or, okay, convex, non-convex too, but most of them were differentiable, right? You guys remember most of them. If they weren't differentiable, we approximated them. But here, there's a big problem with this L1 norm, 
It's non-differentiable. Why is that? So yeah, so I'm going to plot this actually. So this is non-differentiable. How can we perform gradient descent or Lagrangian or anything like that, okay, to this one? So this is something we'll not learn about in this lecture, but it's a pretty cool thing in optimization. So um, just, you know, to show you why this is not differentiable. So imagine if I plot, let's say, in a two-dimensional space, Right, so this is a two-dimensional space. I have alpha equals just, it has two elements, alpha 1 and alpha 2. And I want their sum, the sum of, you know, to be equal to 1. This is my constraint, for example. So I want alpha 1 plus, you know, alpha 2 to be equal to 1, okay? So in this case, when, let's look at particular cases, alpha 1 and alpha 2, right? If you solve this, basically... Okay, it's just uh, if we have here 1, 1, and another, so minus, negative 1, negative 1. So the first one, let's say the solution for this one, 0 plus 1 is equal 1, right? Okay, so these are potential solutions. 0 plus negative 1 is also equal 1 because we're taking the absolute value. So we're going to mark all these four points. And then if you solve this for this constant, if you solve this, you're going to find these lines, okay? So in 2D, it looks like a square. In 3D, it looks like a diamond, okay? And you can see that the contour of this function, now I plotted a contour because it's taking a constant, if you guys remember contours, right? So it's not differentiable right here. So we cannot differentiate it in these points. So this function is not differentiable. Okay, great. Now, the last part is this one. So more challenges with feature selections, especially when you put your hands on uh, codes and you try to find the best feature selection method, then try to find the best number of features to boost your classifier. Believe me, this is not very straightforward. So here, this is a paper published in uh, CNI Mikai 2018. And here, what we did basically, we tried to compare um, uh, the uh, look at how the feature selection method changes when we're changing the data set, but also changing the number of features. So these are, this is, you know, let's say a population of samples. Uh, we trained on disordered and healthy brains, brain graphs, okay? using uh, morphological brain networks. But you guys, what you need to keep in mind or look at is not just the data set. So the data set, it has different points. Uh, we extracted the specific features. For example, let's say um, each sample is represented by a specific feature vector, okay? So we use maybe method one to extract those features, like maybe vectorizing the... Uh, the um, matrix, the graph matrix, or maybe extracting features from images directly. So for each sample, we extracted two different representations, representation one and representation two, okay? And uh, so this is from a second method. So for representation one, we uh, used a different different uh, feature selection methods, relief F, mutual information, etc. And what do you guys know this? That it's quite surprising because here, as we decrease the number of features, well, the performance kind of changes a lot, right? But also, uh, when you look at this, across methods, you don't have, like, a shared pattern. So there's a lot of variation here in performance across different feature selection methods. And the best performing method on the same data set, but, but while changing representations, is not the same. So for the first one, it was the orange one, the mutual information. And for the second one, it was the uh, Laplacian, okay, feature selection method. So this is another issue. Like, uh, in addition to the issue to finding the best number, the optimal number of features, okay? So right here, it's around 10. For the same data set here, it's around 50, right? So this is also changing. And something else, you might think that, oh, you devised the universal feature selection method that will work on any data set and boost the classifier performance. It's not always the case. So your best feature selection method will change with your data. And this is also another issue because 
it means that your feature selection methods are, cannot be universal generally. They might perform on many data sets, but not on all of them. Okay, so this is something to think about when it comes to feature selection method and machine learning. Because here, what we're using, we're using handcrafted features. And when we get to learn about deep learning, we'll know that sometimes by learning how to extract the features, learning, you know, data representations, that would be more universal. But just using handcrafted features, vectorizing images, taking, you know, pixel values, matrices, just extracting those features, will cause a lot of like variability uh, in uh, across data sets, across methods, and across feature numbers. Okay? Great. Any questions?